You're listening to Podcateers. Welcome to episode 248 of Podcateers. Recently, my wife and I had the opportunity to tour the Warner Brothers studio, and I talk a little bit about that experience. We comment on the news that James Gunn is back on as director of Guardians of the Galaxy 3 after being fired by Disney last year. Plus, we continue our stroll down Main Street as I bring you a little bit of history about great moments with Mr. Lincoln. If you'd like to share your comments on anything that we talk about, we encourage you to join the conversation by dropping us a message on the blog post for this episode at podcateers.com slash 248 or by connecting with us on Facebook, Instagram, or on Twitter. Just search for Podcateers. If you like to do that YouTube thing, you can also check out our channel. Just search for Podcateers. We would love it if you took a moment to subscribe and maybe even hit that little bell icon for notifications whenever new videos are posted. Before we kick off this episode, I want to send a huge thank you to the FGP Squad. The FGP Squad is a group of listeners just like you, yes, you listening right now, that help make these episodes of Podcateers possible via their support on Patreon. For more info on how you can become part of the FGP Squad with a monthly or even one-time contribution, head over to podcateers.com slash FGP. If you're unable to join the FGP squad but you still want to help us out and you shop on Amazon, start your next purchase by going to podcateers.com slash Amazon. On that page, you'll find an Amazon button that'll take you to Amazon's homepage using our special referral link. And anything that you buy may earn us a small commission as a thank you from Amazon for mentioning them on this podcast. If you're already using this process, we just want to say thank you. Uh, Oh, one more thing before we get into this episode. This last week, our friends Ron and Mel from the Die Hard Disney Nuts Facebook fan group did a little thing because of love, and now they are married. So huge congratulations to them. Cheers to both of you, your family, and your happily ever after. So that's it. It's time to jump into the episode. Here is episode 248 of Podcateers. I don't know what that is, dude. Really? Really? Oh. I'm in my I'm assuming we're talking about Elmo from Sesame Street? Yes. Yeah. The new I Grover. Mean, Too many? The new Grover. That hurts. <laughs> uh, Tell yeah, me I'm I lying. Never, I've never heard that one. I haven't heard that one either. <laughs> that that was the theme song to Elmo's World. Oh. He and, had his own show? Uh kind of. It's like a little vignette. Within was it within Sesame Street? Sesame Street? Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. But I mean, Elmo's song just became synonymous with the character and that vignette and kids around the world sang the Elmo <laughs> song before they decided to tickle him. Wow. That's and crazy. everyone's listening to be it. like, What? <laughs> <laughs> what now, is this I think, talk? <laughs> I think a lot of people know about Elmo. I'm telling you, he's the new Grover. <laughs> Ugh. More people, I think, will not know who Grover is instead of yeah. Grover. Really? God, that makes me old. <laughs> I am your friendly neighborhood monster, Grover. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> Whew. It's been a day. It's been a day full of caffeines. Oh, so I much so. <laughs> You know what? I think that's why I feel like I'm sweating and I feel so hot because maybe, just maybe, I may have tipped the caffeine into overdose territory. (laughs) It could be the two gallons of coffee. It could be. It could be. (laughs) You could tell who's had coffee, who needs it. It could be. (laughs) But, I mean, it's so good, though. I agree. I mean, I'm sipping on a cup myself right now. Sipping on coffee juice. <laughs> yeah, it um <laughs> I know it's over a month now, but for my birthday, I treated myself to 100% Kona beans <gasps> from Hawaii. Yeah. The and best. I'm rounding the end of that bag and <sighs> Oh, it's hard. There is nothing sweeter except maybe Jamaica <laughs> Blue and maybe some other coffees from around the world that just taste delicious. As you can tell, I like coffee. 
Well, that stuff is the best. Yeah. Gosh, I don't even need sugar with it. And look, I love all sorts of coffee. You know, mm-hmm. I I generally tend not to be a big fan of flavored coffees. So far, the only flavored coffees that I've been really into are the ones from our friends at Expedition Roasters. Oh, but yes. All the other ones, and hashtag not <laughs> sponsored, by the way. But, I mean, I, I just love coffee. And uh-huh. I'm trying to kind of wean myself off. I'm trying to do like more chai tea and black tea for a little bit just to give my body a break. Because, nope. <laughs> you know, your body develops a tolerance and yeah. you have to increase the intake. Right. So I'm at that mm-hmm. point where it's like, OK, I have to switch this up. I've, I've been having to drink a lot more water. I'm not going to get into it, but I've been having to drink a lot more water recently. But I'm trying to switch it up and go to tea for a little bit just to give my body a break and, you know, to give it something different. And as I bid adieu to that bag of that sweet, sweet bean from the island of Kona, (laughs) I think to myself, when will I see you again? When will I see you again? Oh, 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 when can we do this again? (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> I know. Oh, cheesy. It's decaf? my oh, oh, I know. Oh, oh, that there's word in front of me, that. Melissa. There's no cursing on this podcast. It's That's a family what I'm show. saying. How <laughs> dare Man. you? That's editing. Hazen has to. Wow. Do. Jeez. Man, for all the children out there that just heard that word, I'm so sorry, Melissa said that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> it's like. He whose name shall not be spoken, that's about the same <laughs> level right there. Right. <laughs> uh, uh, hey, so speaking of he whose name shall not be spoken, guess yeah. what Lynette and I had a chance to do? What? We toured the Warner Brothers studio. Cool. Oh, I'm glad this. I <laughs> thought you were doing a different segue and I was about to be a little scared. So, yes, let's hear about <laughs> Warner Brothers. <laughs> PG podcast. Come on, wow. Gavin. All right. PG. Uh, Let's hear about it. <laughs> uh, first of all, the tour, super fun. I was not expecting it to be as fun as it was. It did have walking elements uh, along with like tram elements. Uh, I guess the motherland, so to speak, when you go to the Warner Brothers studio is to tour either the Friends set or the Big mm-hmm. Bang Theory set because, you know. Lame. Uh, but wow. overall, Friend, friends every time. <laughs> <laughs> but overall, it was a super cool tour. Uh, it's out in Burbank, and mm-hmm. it's really close to the Walt Disney Animation Building off the 134. Oh, okay. And uh, when we got there, you walk in through the front uh, of the building where they have these huge Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck statues. Super cool. Oh, Great cool. photo op. Happened nice. to be Pokestop, so I was able to spin those <laughs> and get oh some gifts gosh. for friends. Yeah, Gavin. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. I looped it back to Pokemon Go. And what? Uh, we, Welcome we went to s- Poketeers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and then they started driving us around the lot. Dude, the lot is massive. Like oh, I'm they, sure. They started telling us all the history from... You know, when they were sharing uh, the lot with Universal and how they're kind of an open studio where anybody can just kind of come film. You know, they just have to lease the property and they have this massive, massive building just full of props. And when you walk in, there's all these people scrambling around just putting tags on lamps, couches, horses, um, (laughs) you name it, like doorknobs. It's crazy how many props they have. I would, I mean, if this was a rummage sale, I would say it would bring in a couple trillion dollars. (laughs) It was insane how massive it was. They they took us around where they filmed a lot of shows like uh, Gilmore Girls. Mm -hmm. and, uh, And let me tell you, the sets from those shows are shot brilliantly because yeah. they're like some of these sets are literally across the street from each other. The mm-hmm. houses yeah. where some of these characters live are literally back to back in some cases. Like yeah. the the Seaver house from Growing Pains was the house from the front, but then from the side it was like the house of somebody totally different, you yeah. know, on a different show. And yeah, they're super wow. clever. Yeah, it's so clever. And because of the types of lenses that they use on all of those cameras, 
they use forced perspective to just give this insane depth into everything that they're filming that at times you don't even know that it's the same set that they're using for 16 different shows on the WB. Yes, I noticed now because now I know <laughs> I've been behind the curtain. I've seen The Wizard. I know how it works. Nice. Yeah, what what blows my mind is, okay, so that whole town set where Gilmore Girls was filmed, uh-huh. Stars Hollow, it's the exact same town set that The Music Man was filmed on in the 50s. Yeah. There's right? so many. Mind blown. Yeah. <laughs> I learned something new. Right across from that uh, gazebo that they have is like the church um, mm-hmm. from, oh, what is it from? They told us on the tour and I can't remember. But that's not even the one that I remember the most. What I remember is that right next to it is Ma and Pa Kent's house from Smallville. (laughs) Oh, That's the one that I remember the most. And I'm I'm telling you, man, just the whole thing, like the biggest building that they have on that set, they were telling us, oh, yeah, this was used – for uh, the original Batman series, and because they it was the same shot, like literally the exact same shot was used every time Batman and Robin would jump out of the Batmobile and go in to see Commissioner Gordon. So in every single episode, they used the same clip, and the same lady in red is like in the background. Wow. And I guess nobody really ever caught on because it was so quick cut and done in such a way where people just <laughs> thought it was happening, you know, as a different instance each time but it's the exact same clip that's hilarious we had a chance to go see like some of the archive stuff that they have we had uh the opportunity to see up close some of the costumes and props from the harry potter movies from what's the other one oh fantastic beasts Beasts Uh, and where to find fantastic beasts and and where to find them and how to catch them and make them a part of your life because you know that you love them and you want a tiny dragon. I'm pretty sure that's the right. name of the movie. We <laughs> saw... Isn't that called Pokemon Go? No, that's totally <laughs> different. Those are pocket monsters. No, These are full-size monsters. Detective Pikachu. Some of those are pocket <laughs> monsters too. Clearly you haven't seen the film. <laughs> well, I have seen the film. <laughs> oh. But now that you've presented it to me in that way, you are correct. They are Pokemon <laughs> Yes, it's just, I got some Pokeballs. It's points. just Pokemon without Pokeballs. <laughs> it's Pokemon with magic wands. <laughs> yeah. Which is why later this year I will be playing Wizards Unite, the Niantic oh, spinoff of Pokemon Go for Harry Potter fans. And yes, wow. once some friendship thing, I don't know how it's going to work yet, but yes, I will be friends with you if you guys want to play that too. So yeah, super cool. We had a chance to see, dude. We we saw almost every <laughs> Batmobile. I'm not a huge the Batman caffeine. fan. I'm not a huge Batman fan, but it was super cool seeing all of the Bat vehicles because they had the different cars. The only one that wasn't there was the Adam West version of the Batmobile nice. because oh, I guess that one is privately mm-hmm. owned by somebody. But all the other ones were there from Keaton's to the two tumblers mm-hmm. in the latest films, the, the, the cycles. It was super cool. They had a huge Batman statue that like, I had a chance to take a picture of where he's like staring down at you and he's like, I'm Batman. And you're like, so what? I'm Hazen. And he's like, I'm Batman. I'm like, I'm Hazen. Who cares? <laughs> And, and and he won. Oh boy! And he won. He won that stare down. He did. He did. <laughs> nice. Like I don't know. It's almost like he was a statue or something. But we had a chance <laughs> to see that. Finally, I mean, it was what everyone on the tour was waiting for. You do get a chance to go into this gift shop where they have a little coffee area set up to kind of represent Central Perk on Friends, mm-hmm. and it's essentially a Starbucks, but they have a lot of Friends and Central Perk merchandise that you can purchase. They have a small area, like a set of Central Perk that you can go and take a picture at, which I thought was super cool. And oh, yeah. and if you wait long enough and there's a big enough crowd, they pull some people from the crowd and you can pretend to be Joey. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Or Chandler. Uh, I mean, it really depends on what scene that they're doing. But right, it. I That's just thought amazing. it was cool that they allow you to pretend to be friends characters for a moment. Sure. Yeah. Put on a little show for everybody. And then they can all tell you, that was a horrible Joey, Hazen. Not that I did it, <laughs> but I'm just saying, if I did, they would probably uh-huh. say, Hazen, that was a horrible Joey. So <laughs> is there are, there are there photos or video of this experience? 
Uh, there's a photo that Lynette and I took at Central Perk, which oh, nice. I have not posted. There's a bunch of photos that I took of different props. They had an area in one of the theaters that they were using as a set, but they had props and costumes from Wonder Woman, which I thought was super cool. By the way, Gal Gadot's costume for Wonder Woman, insanely tiny. Is she a petite person? I I don't know. Okay. Very much Because they film people, you know, in a way that makes them look bigger on screen. You know, like with John Wayne, they would make smaller door frames and film him from a low angle because he wasn't really that large, right? right? So I don't know if they've done that with her or not. I don't know how big she is. Uh, She's very petite. Really? Very. That's really interesting. Yeah. Really. You know, I don't get a chance to do stuff like this very often. I have to say, I really enjoyed it taking this tour. You know, if I, Mm -hmm. you know, if somebody asked me, would you recommend it? I would say yes. Yes. They have uh, several different options as far as pricing is concerned. Each one correlates to how long the actual tour is and like what type of experience you get. So you could get like a VIP tour where it's just like you and a tour guide walking around for five hours. You could get a three-hour wow. tour, a three-hour tour, even though the weather would start getting rough. It's still a three-hour tour. <laughs> uh, or, you know, a, a smaller <laughs> version of that. Yeah, I've had too much caffeine. <laughs> but, yeah, ultimately, I would totally recommend it. I don't know how to choose what my favorite part of it was. Uh, Probably getting a chance to spend some time with my wife without my kids for a few hours because we don't get a chance to do that all that often. So just just some one-on-one time and hanging out, I think, was the coolest part of the experience. Oh, and (laughs) and let me tell you, when it comes to eating out, I'm super picky. Okay, super picky, Uh especially when it comes to eating like steak and prime rib. And, you know, you could easily screw that up, in my opinion. I've eaten prime rib at many, many places in the Southern California area, including a very, very tasty one at the Stinkin' Rose just slathered in garlic. Yes, that's how I know I'm not a vampire, because I was able to get through that. (laughs) But even that one I thought was just subpar. The only prime rib that I've ever had that I was just crazy happy about was called the Thirsting Cut that I ate at the Magic Castle. And every time I go to the Magic Castle, that is my meal of choice because I just absolutely love that meal. The only other one that I've ever had that I just thought, yep, totally would have this again, was from the Smokehouse right across the street from the Warner Brothers lot. It was fantastic. So well cooked, amazing flavor, and they have some crazy good cheese bread. Like, <laughs> there's no mistaking this is cheese bread. <laughs> is Hashtag it associated? Hungry. <laughs> is it associated with the studio, or is it, was it something separate, like totally across the street? No, it's totally separate across the street. Oh, okay. It's Got been it. around for years. And I guess a lot of movie stars tend to go eat there when they're done filming. And lore has it that they even show up during the day, just like regular folks, because just like (laughs) us, they eat too. Just the day before, I think, our tour guide was saying that Chris Pratt was there, you know, eating. And some of the people on his tour had had a chance to sit down and chat with him. And I thought, huh, that would have been cool to talk to Mm Star-Lord. I heard uh, recently... uh, an incredibly famous uh, host of a podcast showed up. It's some sort of Disney podcast. Yeah, I think yeah. His name, his name was Hyven. Hey, something hey, like that. Hey, yeah. Hey, hey, Hayben. Yeah, something I don't like know. that. I don't remember yeah. exactly what it was. Uh, I think he right? was there with his wife eating. And ironically yeah. enough, he went up to the counter and said, "Hey, here's here's my headshot. Put that up. You categorize <laughs> that." And they said, "Who?" Are you? <laughs> and then that was the end of that. Nice. <laughs> so, yeah, I would totally recommend it. If you guys have an opportunity, especially if you're in the Southern California area, I guess they have discounts for SoCal residents. And if you're not in the Southern California area, but you're going to be visiting, get somebody you know to get you the tickets because it was a super Heck fun experience. Yeah. And uh, I would do it again. I would probably do the longer one, like the VIP one that they have, just to kind of get some more time there. 
Is it something you can just show up and get a ticket for, or do you have to do it in advance and like book a day? You could totally go and just do it that day. Okay, but you have to show like a California license or something. Um, I don't know. I guess if you buy it hmm. online, maybe you don't have to. But you right. could totally just buy it that day because there was people showing hmm. up to the counter and purchasing their tickets. They just okay. prioritized the groups. Uh, earlier in the tour times for the ones that reserved online got it so have you guys ever had a chance to do that tour no 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 it I, sounds like fun though yeah it sounds awesome yeah uh aj and vj had a chance to do it i think last year and oh, cool. vj was like yeah. you gotta go to central perk you gotta go to central perk <laughs> i was like i know one of these days one of these days right <laughs> so so we know that the disney studio has studio tours and we know that warner brothers does and Obviously, Universal does. Do the other major studios or any, even any of the minor studios offer tours like that that we know of? Uh, I think NBC might have something, but okay. I don't know because really think Universal would have something. They might, but considering hmm. that a lot of the resources at Warner Brothers, that's mm -hmm. probably where Paramount goes to film most of their stuff anyway. Oh, uh, that's fair. So it's probably why they don't have something similar. But, I mean, mm -hmm. I wouldn't put it past them. They they do have a storied history as well. And if they did, yeah. I'd like to see that one too. Because now I appreciate the Warner Brothers studio and Warner Brothers as a company way more than I did, you know, before this. And that's including yeah. DC. Man, that's awesome. Yeah. I, 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 I should know this, but I don't. Do you know if the Warner Animation Group is at? the warner brothers studios there <laughs> so funny story uh the, the animation people used to be in the building that is currently the offices for conan o'brien okay? <laughs> nice and ah. the story behind it is that the animators were super big tricksters and as people were walking by, they would open the windows and they would throw water balloons and they would throw all sorts of stuff just to get their jollies off. And they were so angry at them at one point that they shoved them in the opposite corner of the lot. <laughs> wow. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, so they're no longer there. But uh, oh, they eventually ended up moving them off that campus. They're, they're okay. no longer somewhere the else. studio lot. But they were at one point, yes. Nice. So I thought well, that was a cool story. Regardless of shenanigans, I love their movies. They do great work. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I know we don't talk about it a lot. Maybe we should do like a like a side thing where we talk about just other stuff that we like that's not Sweet. Disney related. Yeah. Cool. Because there's so many other topics that I think we would like to get into, but sometimes mm -hmm. we just can't because I, I don't want to say that we're confined by Disney in our podcast, but I think – the majority of our love for Disney is what we express on this podcast. Yeah. Yep. So, I don't know. Let's put a pin on that one. Sure. All righty. All right. So, uh, speaking of <laughs> Warner Brothers and Disney, James Gunn got rehired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I remember when we first talked about this, uh, it was... It was a little baffling how it all went down. And I remember us having a conversation about, you know, just knowing that James Gunn, super talented dude, we mm -hmm. knew that he was going to go out and he was going to get work doing something. And, you know, the rumor was that, you know, his name was out there to revamp Suicide Squad. And lo and behold, yeah. that's what he ended up getting a gig doing. So what's interesting to me is that, one, I'm glad he got rehired, okay, because I, I think the way that it all went down, I, I don't know, the fact that he talked about how he repented and how he had all these comments for shock value when he was just coming up in the industry, and he acknowledged that, you know, it was all just for the shock value and for the quick laugh, and that he knew that it wasn't right. I'm glad that that was revisited and that ultimately Disney decided to bring him back on board, Mm -hmm. uh, but how much of that do you think was a response to him getting the gig doing Suicide Squad? Oh, I didn't think about that. I Yeah, it's hard to say. I, I, I don't know. I think it's more from the pressure. But also, I mean, when this happened initially, it was just that one time where everyone online, like anyone big, was getting in trouble for 
things that they had said or things they had tweeted. And I'm just glad Disney just decided, you know, they've seen the light, if I could say that. Yeah. Um, About it. And, you know, because it's true. I mean, he did acknowledge everything. He did say he was sorry. And that was a while ago. So it wasn't really anything recent. I'm just glad everything is just, you know, we're moving forward. We're going to get this film. You know, all is good in the end. You know, I had a conversation with somebody about uh, about James Gunn getting rehired this week. And they asked me how I felt about it. And I said, I'm glad that it happened. They straight up said, well, you're a hypocrite. You know, how could you be against John Lasseter, you know, not getting a second chance and James Gunn getting rehired? And I said two totally different topics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. James Gunn basically called himself out years ago and said, hey, I screwed up. I was young. I acknowledge that I screwed up and I'm very sorry. Let me move on with my life. And it wasn't yeah. until somebody went and dug into his past that this came to light. What John Lasseter was doing was current and it was just happening over and over and it was hurting people in present day. So it's mm -hmm. a totally different thing. So it it is it is difficult for some people to put those two things together because they, they do feel that, you know, they go hand in hand. But like you said, Mel, it was happening at a time where people weren't necessarily looking for for proof. They were just like, oh, it's out there. Boom, they're done. Uh, people's yeah. careers were ending, you know, because of stuff like this. And it was... Um, I think we talked about it briefly that it was sentencing without the the proof of, of what happened in most cases. And so that's why I'm happy that they did revisit this and that they did rehire him because, you know, I've had a lot of time to think about this over the course of, you know, however many months it's been since it happened. And, and I could tell you that high school Hazen is so different than current day Hazen. You know, and as we get older, we grow as people. We yeah. talk to others, we learn more, we read more, we experience more. And unless you're afforded the opportunity to grow as a person, you can't become better, right? Yeah. And I think this is one of those instances where people like James Gunn straight up acknowledge, hey, I wasn't that great when I first started. This was the type of comedy that was out there. And I was just trying to make a name for myself. And I'm very sorry for what I did. And now it's different. He's a he's a different person. So I'm glad that this happened. And so, yeah, I mean, do you guys agree with that? Oh, I agree. Yep. I totally do. And I, I, do. I like your example. Because, yeah, high school Melissa would not be going on the mic talking yeah. like this. <laughs> yeah, <sometimes. laughs> That's for sure. Yeah. Totally different people. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we heard from some of our listeners on on Instagram about this. But ultimately, it just it still makes me wonder how much of it was a response for him, you know, going out and redoing Suicide Squad, which was better than most of the DC movies that were out there. But considering that. James Gunn took this ragtag bunch of heroes called the Guardians of the Galaxy and made this amazing franchise. Who's to say he wouldn't do the same with this ragtag bunch of he of pseudo heroes, anti heroes, or villains turned heroes called the Suicide Squad? You know, and considering its direct competition, I don't. I couldn't see anybody else directing Guardians because he's the reason that guardian succeeded right it's he poured his heart and soul into it and now we have that amazing franchise so i'm glad he's back i don't know if he's gonna do any more but i can tell you that i think suicide squad is now gonna be awesome <laughs> <laughs> as much as it pains me to say it You'll have to tell me all about it. Same. <laughs> it's like, Gavin's like, eh, I barely care about the MCU, and that's something that we talk about. I could care Ooh. less about DC. Is I'm... it animated? It can nope. be. Nope. No. Then I'm out. <laughs> can be. Justice League <laughs> had an animated representation. Actually, the Wonder Woman movie that DC did, like, whatever, three years ago, like the year before the, the live-action one came out, mm -hmm. was freaking awesome. Yeah. 
Really good, yeah. It was straight to DVD, but it was it was great. I didn't even know it existed. Oh, dude, you can get it at Target for like eight bucks. It's totally worth it. I mean, why? <laughs> All right, <laughs> dude. I I'm barely. Gonna, look, I'm not gonna I, twist your arm. <laughs> the only reason I watch Teen Titans Go is one because I've seen Teen Titans and I like the cartoon because it's just yeah. so snarky and punchy. And my kids were like, "Dad, can we watch this?" I was like, "Ah, uh, yes." So we went so to watch good. Teen Titans Go. And I remember when I saw it, I was like, "Oh man, Stan Lee's in this." <laughs> <laughs> It's so good. So it all wrapped around. Full circle. Yep. (laughs) Ah. All right. Well, before we get into the main topic for this episode, I do want to remind everybody that this episode of Podcast Tears is brought to you by the generosity of a fine group of folks that we like to call our podcast fairy godparents, but they call themselves the FGP Squad. And you can find a little bit more information on how you can become a member of the FGP squad by going over to podcasters.com slash FGP. Uh, it's uh, a great group of people that I've personally had a chance to become amazing friends with. Melissa is one of those people. I still am. And speaking of the <laughs> FGP squad, I just want to send a quick shout out to our friend Emily from the Walt Vault who just had their second baby. So congratulations to her and to her husband, Luis. It's super nice. cool. We just want to send out positive thoughts and some pixie dust your way because, you know, woo, two kids are a handful. <laughs> I don't envy you. <laughs> <laughs> they are a handful, let me tell you. So, yeah, more information on that, podcasters.com slash FGP. And I do have one other announcement because this is something that I have been working on, no joke, for about a year now. I, I, I went back and I looked at my first email, and it was March 30th, 2018, just to give you some context, okay? Early last year there was this weird spreadsheet flying around the internet about how Spotify was going to start streaming podcasts. And it was this huge deal because they were like, oh my God, Spotify is so big, so many listeners, so many ears on your product. I thought, wow, that would be fantastic if we can get on Spotify. Just fill out this form and you will be considered. And so almost instantly, all the big names in podcasting were there, Mm -hmm. like all these names that just, it would totally dwarf us in in listenership, right? And over time, I thought, well, I still want to be on Spotify. You know, there's a lot of people that use it instead of other podcasting apps, and I still Mm want to do it. So I got in contact with Spotify, and they said, oh, yeah, don't worry about it. It's super simple. Just go over to the company that you host with and just submit it, and they will add you to the streams. And I was like, but we don't do that. We do self-hosting. You know, I, I... I went through the trouble of learning all of that so that we didn't have to do that. Right. And they said, yeah, then no soup for you. Oh, and so to... for a year, I've been going back and forth. And I felt like, why am I being punished for learning how to do something? You know, I, yeah. I don't understand why we can't be on your service. Come on, let us play with you. And they uh, just back and forth. And ultimately, they said, look. We're going to start opening this up later in the year. That was last year. So maybe when we do that, maybe you can jump on the service. But as of right now, the only way to do it is if you're currently hosting with one of these companies. And so there's all these other podcasts that were easily jumping onto Spotify because of their link and hosting with these other companies. And finally, after pretty much a year, we're finally on Spotify. Nice. No way. Yes, we are officially awesome. on Spotify now. If that is your aggregator and podcast app of choice, if you go to podcasters.com and scroll down, you will now see an icon for Spotify that you can click on. It'll launch your app and you'll be able to subscribe to our feed directly in Spotify. So to all of you that emailed me or messaged me on Instagram and said, why aren't you on Spotify? It's because Spotify didn't want to play with us. But now <laughs> now they opened the gate and they said, okay, fine, bring your ball in so we could play. Oh, and, oh man. We're now. sitting with the cool kids in the lunchroom Yay! now. Right? Right. <laughs> right. So I'm, I feel super happy about that. Thank you for all of your comments and your support and listening through the website or through all the other means that we had available until we were on Spotify. I, I can't 
tell you how much I appreciate your support and holding on and sticking with us while we jumped onto Spotify. So yay. Yay. <laughs> that's so awesome. And that's not the coffee talking. I'm like, like so stoked <laughs> about this. That's really cool, man. Yeah. So what's left? What 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 are we what are we shooting for next? AM radio? I heart radio. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. That's that's All the right. last We're one. Coming then. at you, I heart. Yeah, I heart radio and sign my life cool. away to Ryan Seacrest. Sweet. <laughs> okay, before we move on, we got to talk a little March mayhem. March mayhem. Because yeah. It was a crazy week of matchups. We had to skip a day because of technical difficulties with Instagram. Not our fault. Instagram's fault. Uh, I heard that it was like pretty widespread. Like Instagram and Facebook were yeah like, majorly down. Like yeah. a big big outage. Uh, so anyway, uh, thanks for your patience, everyone. Uh, we just bumped everything back by a day. But this past week, we had some crazy matchups. So the matchup, first matchup of the week, right out of the gun, was Woody versus Buzz, yeah. which was the most talked about matchup <laughs> probably in the first round. And Woody ended up edging out Buzz. I was a little sad. I don't know how that happened. Really? You thought Man. Buzz would win? I really thought Buzz was going to win. <laughs> And uh, I remember yeah. having a conversation on Twitter with uh, FGP squad member Albert, and we were both kind of like, Ugh, I guess when you're Andy's first toy, you're always Andy's first toy. I guess. I, you know, I really had no idea which way that would go, but I I voted for Buzz. I thought I did too. You know, yeah, of the too. two, he's my favorite, but I, I love them both. So, you know, I'm happy for Woody. The next one was a totally off the wall matchup where we had Ariel versus Remy from Ratatouille. <laughs> and uh, of course, if you're the only mermaid in the catalog, you're going to beat the only rat in the catalog. So, yeah. Uh, Ariel won, I think, by a landslide in that one. And then uh, Edna Mode versus Merida, and Edna ended up winning that matchup. And then the final matchup of the, the week was our two Bells, Tinkerbell versus Bell. And Bell ended up winning, which uh, ended Hazen's week on a high note because oh, that's his girl. Oh yeah! <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah! I, I, I was sad. I really wanted the underdog Tink to win that one. Same. And you know what? At one point, I had to look back, and I'm like, "Let me see what's happening." It was fifty-fifty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think it was a close matchup uh, most of the way, but but Bell ended up pulling it out, and it it makes sense. Uh, you know, I it's kind of like. Um, well, I'm surprised by Edna because she's kind of a side character and Tink no. is kind of a side character. I know you don't <laughs> think she is, but she really is. Uh, but Belle is like, I mean, she's a main character, you know, like she's so I, I'm not ultimately surprised that she won. But, you know, there's a lot of love for Tink out there. So I thought maybe she'd be able to pull it off. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I would agree with you that Tinkerbell's a side character until they gave her her own set of movies and her own That's hollow. fair. She does have her own franchise, so you're right. So. Yeah, I take it back. Both main characters. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, when I was looking at the, at the percentages, like the Ariel and Remy one was like 65% Ariel, 35% Remy. <laughs> the, the one for Woody and Buzz... That was 63% Woody, 37% Buzz. Crazy. I don't no. I can't know how that, that happened. Yeah, that's and then crazy. Edna versus Merida, again, 63% to 37%. And then Bell and Tinkerbell, uh, most of the day were at 50 50. It was like 49 51, 51 wow. 49, 50 50. And it just kept juggling till the end of. Like maybe like the last four hours of voting, Bell took it with fifty eight percent of the vote. Wow, that's pretty close. Yeah, that's awesome. So it was a good week of matchups. I I was excited to see how it all uh, shook out there, and it sets up for some really interesting matchups so far in round two. We've got one more to be cited in round one on Monday for Wally and Sully. But, uh, I mean, really, I think the toughest one that I see in round two so far is going to be that Bell versus Genie matchup. Oh, man, that's going to tear some people apart, I think. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Ariel's going up against Mickey in round two. And oh. <laughs> I can, I already feel Mickey's just taking it. There's, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, I, Stitch it's versus It's going to be tough, Edna. though. Oh, yeah, I didn't see that one. one coming. Yeah. 
And then Dang. Woody will take on the winner of the Wally versus Sully match. Yeah. Oh, that's going to be a hard yeah. one. <laughs> Round two is shaping up to be pretty interesting as well. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of turning into the Pixar quadrant over there. Isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it? Because it's, it's going to be three Pixars and one Disney on that side after round one. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. Hmm. Well, if you guys want some uh, information on March Mayhem, remember you can go to podcasters.com, scroll down a bit, and you'll see the March Mayhem logo. Click on it. You'll get all the information as far as all of our round winners, including all of the matchups, the days that they have happened and the days that they're happening. You can vote on Instagram. Make sure that you're following us. We're at Podcasters. Voting is every day from about noon to noon the next day. And it's it's going to get super tough. So make sure that you go out and represent for your favorite characters as we get into round two and round three. I'm excited. Yeah. I'm excited. Team no capes. Heck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no capes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, I think it's about time that we jump into uh, our topic for this episode. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about Main Street. You know, Melissa told us uh, about some of the shops. And in this episode, I wanted to tell you a little bit about great moments with Mr. Lincoln and how that kind of came to be and the history. You know, everybody knows about President Lincoln. And I'm going to tell you what the Disney connection is. So cool. strap on your s- story ears. That sounds weird. <laughs> you know what? I'm going to own it. I said it. I'm going to own it. Let's do this. <laughs> All right. Let me get out my story ears and strapping them on now. Oh, go. Boy. All right. Here <laughs> we go. So four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Those were the words recited by President Abraham Lincoln on November 19th, 1863. And although there are people that will state otherwise, President Lincoln is often revered by many as the best president the nation has ever had. Abraham Lincoln was a tenacious man that was met with much adversity as he tried to bring a nation together through his belief that one day he could make that very thing and much, much more happen. And ultimately, he was seen as a hero by many. As kids, a lot of us had different definitions of superheroes. Captain America, Superman, these were heroes of a different nature. These were heroes on paper. But one thing was consistent. They all believed in good, justice, and they went up against all odds to bring forth positive change. (coughs) Except for that one time (coughs) that Captain America decided to become a part of Hydra. But we're not going to talk about that. (coughs) Captain America, Iron Man would never do that. (coughs) Just saying. (laughs) <laughs> I never thought you would use this particular vehicle to throw shade on Captain Mar- I'm just Captain saying. America. <laughs> I'm just saying. It's just, you know, it happened. I'm just going to throw it up. Unbelievable. <laughs> uh, so at this point, you kind of might be thinking to yourself, dude, seriously, this isn't history class. What are you talking about? Why is this even relevant? Well, it's relevant because about half a century after the delivery of that famous speech, A very young Walt Disney would go on to memorize all 272 words of the speech, and he would recite it to his classmates while wearing a top hat made of stovepipe. And it was so well regarded when he gave the presentation at school that they had him do it over and over for the entire school, not just his class. And that that ovation and, and how he was represented and just how he made people feel stuck with him you know, as a child, and and he carried that with him until until the day that he passed, essentially. So Walt was fascinated by Lincoln, and he consistently stated that Lincoln was his favorite president. Lincoln was basically one of Walt's heroes. So fast forward to 1954, when the creation of a land that we call Disney begun. Considered the oldest building in the park now, the Main Street Opera House once served as a wood mill where most of the wooden features of the park were created. It stayed that way until around 1961, when the first floor was converted to the phone center of Disneyland. 
1963, the Illinois legislator passed a bill establishing the Illinois Commission for the New York World's Fair. And they wanted to figure out a way to really represent Illinois in the attractions of the World's Fair because of the steep competition that would be coming in. And they decided that their theme would be Land of Lincoln. Now, by now, Walt and the, the Imagineers at WED were already working on audio animatronic technology, and it was no surprise to anybody that Walt's first attempt at a realistic humanoid figure would be his childhood hero, Abraham Lincoln. Walt was offered the opportunity to display the Lincoln animatronic at the World's Fair. The state of Illinois appointed an authority on President Lincoln who ended up meeting with Walt at WED, and he was so impressed that the governor of Illinois himself came out to meet with Walt, and by the end of their meeting, he was adamant that the animatronic be a part of the Illinois Pavilion. The only thing stopping the project was just how crazy the cost was. It was insane. The Illinois legislation was so excited about getting the attraction that they allocated $1 million. And this is like $1963 million, right? Yeah. Keep that in, in consideration. Yeah. But they never consulted with Walt or with WED, and it turned out to be too little for the construction and operating costs. Wow. So a lot of negotiation went on over the course of 18 months to try to get Lincoln to the World's Fair. And the technology was so good in bringing the 16th president to life that negotiations resulted in the only instance of financial support for any exhibitor at the World's Fair. So wow. keep that in mind. The World's Fair people, the people putting these exhibits together, never funded exhibitors. And this was the only time that it happened. That's how good wow, this tech that's... was for the time. Yeah. By the time that all the negotiations had ended, the World's Fair was so close to opening that everyone just went to work. Night and day, work, work, work. The Lincoln animatronic <laughs> was recreated using priceless artifacts, including photos and a life mask made by renowned sculptor Leonard Valk in 1860. The way that the audio animatronic functioned was that a recording was played from a magnetic tape, and the tones from the tape triggered certain functions in the animatronic. Those tones would send electrical signals to specific valves that use hydraulic fluid to bring Lincoln to life. Wed studied all of Lincoln's mannerisms and speech patterns to incorporate it into the robotic president. And after all this, everything went smoothly and everyone went home happy, said <laughs> nobody that day <laughs> because it didn't. They had so many problems. When the animatronic was installed in New York at the fair... It wasn't working properly. Imagineers were working round the clock to get it back up and running. And on a night that Walt was going to showcase the president to over 500 dignitaries from the state of Illinois, who you may recall helped fund the entire project, it just it wasn't working. And so, oh, geez. and this is really what the essence of Walt is, at least to me. Instead of putting on a show that was just kind of okay for those dignitaries, he went out on stage, put himself on the line, and said, Yeah, we're canceling it. Nothing to see here, folks. Make your way out the door. And so they were like, but Mr. Disney, we gave you money. He's like, yep, and you'll see it working on another day. And he just <laughs> sent them on their merry way. What would much rather disappoint all those people than put on a performance that was just okay? You know, and, and that's amazing. Yeah. You know, I that's that's why Disneyland is so awesome. Yeah, it is. Right. And I, I can tell you that that's one of the values that I've really tried, you know, to put forth in the podcast. We try to put out something that's just really great sounding. And if it's not, I, I take listener feedback and I try to make things better. And, you know, it's always made us level up. You know, and that's uh, mm -hmm. that's something that I've always admired about Walt. And that was the case in this instance. There was so much writing on the line that he's like, yeah, I'm not going to show you something that doesn't work. I'm just going to cancel it altogether. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the problems, one of the major problems that the animatronic had was that it was leaking hydraulic fluid. And eh, take a stab in the dark. Can you guess what color it was? <laughs> the color of blood. That's right. Not pretty. <laughs> Bob Gurr once said in an interview that a guest actually accused Walt of tactlessly reassassinating the president. 
<laughs> and eventually, what? yeah, imagine. <laughs> Eventually, the problem went away when the animatronic was redesigned with advanced aerospace materials and principles that they use for space stuff and for planes and everything. So I'm glad that they finally got to that point. But uh, I mean, to be at a point where they're like, stop killing the president again. That's big, right? That, that's, yeah, that's horrible to hear. Uh, In 1965, the attraction was installed at the Main Street Opera House using a second Lincoln animatronic that Wed had built in case the first one failed. Although the installation was far from the original idea of the Hall of Presidents that Walt had when the idea of expanding Main Street to Edison Street and Liberty Square was being developed, Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln has withstood the test of time. The show ran until 1973 when it was replaced by the Walt Disney Story. Then in 1975, the show was adapted to include the Walt Disney Story along with Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. Then eventually it closed in 2000. A year later, it was replaced with a version that focused more on the Civil War. And that one closed in 2004. And from 2005 to 2009, the show was completely gone while Disneyland showcased Disneyland, the first 50 magical years. That was my best hmm. Bill impression. I know it's horrible. Mm, That's my best Bill. Perfect. Yeah, needs some work, buddy. Right? <laughs> uh, which was ultimately a tribute to the first 50 years of the park, as you might have been able to tell by the title. Uh, and that's the version I think that a lot of people remember because that's the one where they had Steve Martin doing the pre-show and the post-show. Mm-hmm. I know that's for certain the one that I most remember. Uh, And then in 2009, it was updated again as the Disneyland story presenting great moments with Mr. Lincoln. So, I mean, a little bit of a title change, but it has been revamped. The Hall of Presidents went on to open at Magic Kingdom. And uh, I would say maybe uh, almost 10 years ago now. Walt Disney Imagineering doesn't develop all of their animatronics anymore. The animatronics are actually now developed by Garner Holt Productions, which was a company in San Bernardino. They moved out to Redlands. And I think last year we ended up talking about one of the most advanced animatronics that they made. It was, of course, Abraham Lincoln. And I just remember saying the eyes need to be more squishy. Because everything else uh, yes. <laughs> was just uncanny. And the movement, yeah. <laughs> how uh, impeccable the timing was, and how many mm-hmm. gestures and facial expressions they could get. But just the eyes were too hard. They needed to be more squishy. But ultimately, <laughs> uh, the show itself, it's been there for so long that I think that if it ever went away from the Main Street Opera House, people would be upset. You know, it's become such a staple Uh, of Main Street. And uh, for the people that know the story of how Abraham Lincoln inspired Walt Disney, I think it is uh, it it brings everything in the park together because it was Mm -hmm. pre the idea of Disney and even pre Walt as an adult, pre Mickey and pre aspirations of anything that we see. You know, he was his first hero. So I think to Disney fans, Abraham Lincoln in the park means a lot to them. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's one of the things that, for whatever reason, is in that legacy of the World's Fair, which that made such a huge impact on the Disney parks. And that piece right there, it's not discussed as much as obviously as it's a small world world of progress you know those those became more like e-ticket attractions at the parks and still exist today as well and i feel like a lot of people walk right by the opera house and they i know a lot of people that i talked to have never even gone in there and experienced that attraction and it's really surprising to me and i think that everybody should just give it a shot you know they may not be like blown away or entertained in the same way they would be as if they were on Space Mountain or, you know, Radiator Springs Racers. It's a totally different type of experience. But just the audio animatronic alone is spectacular. This updated version is so good, like Hazen mentioned. There are moments where you can see him breathing and you hear him like release a sigh. Mm-hmm. And it's so, so good, you know? It's, you know, 
let's be honest. It's, you, you're never tricked. You don't feel like, oh, my gosh, that's a real person standing there. You know that it's an audio animatronic. But within that technological boundary, they've gotten really, really good. Yeah. And it's getting closer and closer all the time. You know, we see we've seen um, the animatronic from the attraction in uh, Pandora, Pandora World of Avatar. Yeah. Uh, you know, with its really realistic movements, the the animatronics in the Frozen attraction in the Norway Pavilion have really fluid motions and, and they look great. So they're really kind of getting the knack of this more and more. I love that they're, it seems like in the last few years, they've really gone back and decided to further develop animatronics, which had kind of seemed stale for a while. I've even noticed recently that since the addition of Red, in the pirates attraction they've really gone in and upgraded the animatronics of a lot of the pirates and their movements are so much more lively and fluid and beautifully animated now that it just it it brings that attraction up a level and i feel like the great moments with mr lincoln attraction did the exact same thing a year or two ago when they upgraded it and i i've I fully endorse it. I, I go in and watch that thing probably once a month just because uh, it's such a technological marvel. It's a nice place to sit down and relax for a minute. And if you haven't seen it, I, I, I do recommend it. Oh, yeah. I, I really, I really like that attraction. And even if it's like a non, you know, if it's not busy and by saying not busy, I mean like not a holiday because if you mm-hmm. try to go on fourth of july memorial day president's day it is going to be packed mm-hmm. but the yeah. energy is always different um for me personally speaking i know it's an animatronic but gosh darn it when he's talking it's like you're so glued and you're paying attention i mean maybe some people fall asleep but for <laughs> me i watch it and i really like i it just takes me to that, you know, that moment when you're listening to him speak and whatnot. Yeah. And not just that. I mean, the, just the whole history part of it. I would recommend, however, like I said, it was would be busy on holidays. Definitely check it out on a holiday if you're there. It's really, really cool. I do miss when we had the Voices of Liberty and they would oh, sing yeah. before. Mm-hmm. I mean, it just added that little touch, but still, the attraction, you didn't really need that. I mean, it's still, it's a really good thing to yeah. see and check out. Well, and it's really great in the tradition of Disney storytelling because the sequencing of it is is so well-timed. Mm-hmm. You know, they if you're in that outer room as, you know, you're waiting, it's kind yeah. of like the pre-show area. You see that amazing scale model of the Capitol. And then there are great paintings and sculptures in that room. It's like a gallery and there are paintings of Lincoln and sculptures of him. And it kind of gets you in the time space of, of, you know, the story you're about to hear. There's a little pre-show narration that happens. And then you go into the attraction itself, which is in like a theater. And I'm not going to do any spoilers for those of you who haven't been on it because I feel like it's one that a lot of people haven't been on and I want them to go experience it. It's not just curtains up and there's Lincoln and he's talking and that's it. Like th- it's more, much more of a show and there's a build up to it and yeah. there's a crescendo yeah. and a climax and it's it's you know it's it's exciting in its own way. So I think it's in the greatest tradition of Disney storytelling attractions that this uh, sits and I. Again, I I enjoy it and encourage anybody who hasn't seen it to go see it. Yeah, the presentation is definitely that of a stage show, which, I mean, I know it essentially is, mm-hmm. but without a real person behind it. You know, the, yeah. the yeah. further you sit in that theater as you're watching it, the more realistic it feels because you begin to lose sight of the fact that it is an audio (laughs) animatronic and you just Mm -hmm. get sucked into everything that they're saying, the entire story. And they don't have this as part of the show anymore because it was one of the last iterations. But when the Battle Hymn of the Republic would play, like, man, you just walked out of there like, yeah, just sir, <laughs> yeah. You know? And now it's different. I think they end it with America the Beautiful now. Uh, I thought they, I thought it was a, 
original song that they end it with now. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Yeah. Um, it, which is awesome. As you can I, tell, I it's like been a while since song. I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, ultimately, you do just get taken in by the entire presentation and the entire story. You know, I, I think with other animatronics around the world, I feel like I'm a little bit more forgiving of them, like including, you know, in Pandora and including Elsa. Uh, yeah. Uh, even even be, the, be... the Jack Sparrow character, because to me, they're all just characters. They're all cartoonish yeah. to me. But this is so implanted in real life that mm-hmm. it, it is held to such a high standard, not because it was the first animatronic that was worked on by Walt and Imagineering, but more because of the standard that it's trying to uphold. And you're right, it is getting to a point where, you know, we've we've kind of briefly mentioned this, and I know we've talked on the side about the uncanny valley that you see with 3D animation and how realistic mm-hmm some of those 3D characters can be. And the Uncanny Valley, the TLDR, is that it's this space in your brain that when you see these animated characters, you think, are they real or are they animated? And they're not real enough that it feels super uncomfortable for your brain, but they're so close to being real that your brain thinks they're real. And so there's this weird internal struggle in your brain where those two things don't click. The Lincoln animatronic is bordering on that. Like, it is getting so close that at one point, I think we might see it just walking around the park, and then you're going to be like, hey, Abe, and he's going to be like, hey, Zen, nice to see you again, sir. Tip of the top hat. (laughs) I agree that that there... It's different when you're looking at Lincoln than any others because it is the singular example where they're going for... Well, I take that back. It's not. But it is the most prominent example where they are going for true realism. The other example that we currently have in the parks is the new characters on the Rivers of America. Uh, yeah. The Native American characters, yeah. which are fabulously done. Uh, they're the You've got the shaman medicine man character up on the bluff. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he looks great, you know, and, and again, you see him from afar, you know, like if you were in the back row right. of the Lincoln presentation. Yeah. So he looks great, you know, from that distance. But yeah, it's very different than the Pirates and Elsa because they're, you know, a caricature. Uh, they're cartoons, you know, or they're just more silly in nature. So they're they're going to be a little more, you know, cartoony in their behavior. Right. You know what I think this is all leading up to? What? What's huh? the next big anniversary Disneyland has coming? 75? Yeah. Not as much for that one, but I kind of think that for the 100th anniversary, they want to have oh, okay. this so dialed in that we get a Walt Disney animatronic in the parks. Spoilers. I don't know that for sure. <laughs> no, I know, but uh, that uh, may have been involved in our next episode. No! Oh! <laughs> super super spoiled no! wow well let's call it a preview then <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean ultimately i think they're really tuning the technology to a point where just like walt didn't want to put on a show that wasn't up to his standards the company itself wants to make sure that they can put out an animatronic of Walt that will do Walt justice. And Mm -hmm. I I just, I think that's what it's leading up to at this point. Yeah. I I think that would be absolutely fan freaking tastic. Right. Yeah. And then he'll be walking around main street and be like, Hey Zen, how are you? Good to see you again, my friend. I'll be like, Walt, good to see you. (laughs) Then we'll go to Carnation cafe I'll have some Mickey waffles. He'll have a can of oil. Whoa, whoa. If I'm hanging out with Walt, we're going to Club freaking 33, I was going to say, he's going to walk later me in the, the day, the dude. Door. In the morning, you start off at Carnation Cafe. <laughs> nope. Breakfast at 33. <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. I got I got nothing else on uh, the Main Street Opera House and Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. So... If you guys have any questions that I didn't talk about or that I did talk about, you know, join the conversation over on Instagram, Twitter, or on Facebook. I'll do my best to answer them. I've always claimed that I'm not a historian, that I 
think of these things randomly sometimes. But, you know, in preparation for this, I learned a whole bunch of stuff that I didn't know before. And I'm really happy about that because whenever we do these types of episodes, I feel like my knowledge base just increases a tiny bit. Yeah. And my Grinchy heart grows a few, uh, <laughs> a few sizes. Nice. All right. Is there anything else before we wrap up this episode? I don't think so. No. Right I on. can't think of anything. I, I kind of want to go hang out on Main Street, though. Kind of. Right? <laughs> right? I do, too. You want me to recite the entire Gettysburg Address? Uh, because fun fact, I had to learn that while I was in school and present it to the class. Nice. That oh, is a fun you. fact. Yeah, it was not something I would have ever wanted to do on my own, probably. But I had to <laughs> do it. So no? No? Yeah, no. We're going to pass on that. Uh, did you ever have, so like in that scenario, like where you had to memorize the speech, uh, I remember in several classes in my schooling, they would say you can either memorize it and deliver it in front of the class, like speak it out loud, or you can write it out. But if you wrote it out, you had to get it letter perfect and like punctuation perfect. No. And I, depending on what it was, you could opt either way. Did you ever have that option? No. I did. I always thought that was a right. That's a <laughs> weird option, right? Like I, I me, did that. Like I wrote it. <laughs> if you're learning about speeches and speech, like. You should have to, like, deliver it, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I always thought that was a weird one. Uh, of course, I took the writing option because it was easier <laughs> a couple times. But <laughs> No, we all just had to memorize it and stand in front of the class. Yeah. And I remember there was people in the class that, I mean, I, I remember doing my best to have the same cadence throughout uh, the speech. Uh -huh. And I remember there was people that were, that were just reciting that I four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent and a new nation. And I was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> it's about the performance, it man. It is. <laughs> it is. But nobody ever funny. considered that. And I just thought, you know what? Let them do them. I don't care. I, I did it right. That's right. I did it right. There you go. <laughs> and now you're hosting a successful podcast. That's right. And where are they? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I didn't keep in touch with any of them. <laughs> That's going to be it for this episode. Again, if you guys want to join the conversation, make sure to hit us up on Instagram, Twitter, or on Facebook. Just search for Podcateers. And hey, if you shop on Amazon, remember, the best way to help us out is to start that journey on Podcateers.com slash Amazon. You'll see the big Amazon button when you go to that page. Unless you're viewing it on a mobile device, it might be smaller than looking at it on a big screen but trust me, it's big, super big. And mm. if you click on it, it'll take it to Amazon <laughs> using our special referral link. And anything that you purchase may earn us a small commission as a thank you from Amazon because we mentioned them on this podcast. And so to everybody that's already taken the time to do that, we just want to say thank you because it makes a difference at the end of the month. You don't think so, but it does. It makes a huge difference. All right. That will wrap it up for this week. So... Until next time, keep dreaming, keep moving forward, and always remember to pass on the magic. Have a great week, everyone. Bye. Major look. <laughs>